Christ, a television ministry of the Lutheran Church of Peace in Platteville, Wisconsin. Here's your host, Rev. Jeff Peterson. Well, today our study is on the risen Jesus, that Jesus is risen and that his risen presence can fill our hearts this day as well. And so I read from Luke chapter 24, verses 36 through 49. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking that they, were, that they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of bro broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you, Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you and my father, I'm going to send uh, you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Jesus Christ is risen. That's the greatest news that the world has ever heard. That Jesus Christ, who is crucified, and who was buried in a tomb is risen from the dead. And I mean, this is not only good news, but it is good news that is hard to believe. And after all, we can go through life and we hear a lot of bad news. You know, that's one of the things as we watch the news on TV or read the newspapers, or as we just listen to people talk, you know, we hear so much bad news to the point where, oh, well now we can almost believe anything anything that is bad. But then to hear some good news, it's almost like we don't even know how to take it. Good news? Something happened? It's almost like we want to ask you, how did something good happen? What's the formula? How were you able to go against the current of the river here and to have something good happen in your life? Tell me about it. How did you do it? Well, hopefully it's not quite that bad. You know, as much as we may have bad things that happen in our lives, and hopefully there's a lot of things in your life that you're thankful for. A lot of good things that are happening. And so not only in your own life, but as you look at the lives of your neighbors and your friends and your church people, and as you look at, at your community to say, you know, there are some good things that are really happening here. And I guess the more good things that we can see happening, the more that we can believe that there can even be even a greater good. So the good news of Jesus Christ being arisen from the dead. Now, I have heard it said, and maybe it's just all part of negative thinking that you know, somehow just seems to, to blow through like the wind, but when people say, if you hear of something that is really almost too good to be true, it probably isn't. And so that's the whole thing about this good news, is that it's good beyond belief. Like it's going to take a lot more than just simply for me to say, well, this is good news, and I'm going to believe in it. And the person next to me is going to say, well, you're, you're a fool. When people die, they're buried, and that's it. It's not like you ever go to the funeral home, and as you're going into the funeral home, the deceased for whom you're going to go and pay your last tribute is the one who is welcoming you at the door. That just doesn't happen. People don't rise from the dead. Jesus 
is different. Jesus is God. He's the eternal God. Jesus who knows no death. Jesus has always been, and, or God has always been, and God will always be. And so who is Jesus? Jesus is God in human flesh. And so he took upon himself our life. And he lived his life in this world, experiencing life as a human in every point, including that of dying. Yeah, Jesus was tempted to sin. Jesus knew what it was like to lose, to have a loved one die. Jesus knew what it was like to put in a hard day's work. As he worked as a carpenter before he started his public ministry, he probably knows what it's like to have a hammer hit his thumb. He probably had hammers hitting his thumbs in more ways than just working as a carpenter. And so we must always remember that. But that Jesus was also divine. As he was going about his ministry, he was doing a lot of amazing things. He was healing the sick. He fed the 5,000. He raised, for instance, Lazarus from the dead. He was doing a lot of good things. He was uh, preaching in a way that was instilling hope amongst the people. That the people were excited. There was certainly quite a buzz going around in communities as Jesus would enter in. Because they knew that Jesus was going to be doing good things. But because of jealousy and because of power and, and popularity, the religious leaders of the day, and, and here again I can see all those things, but really the bottom line is our sinful human nature. God comes into this world and we have a problem with it. Just as God comes into our world today, most people are just going to say, I don't want to hear any of that. Don't shove that down my throat. I don't want God in my life. My life is fine the way that it is. Or maybe my life isn't fine, but I'm going to live it the way that I want it to be, even if it's not fine. I don't want God influencing my life. And so now it seems like more and more our society is even getting laws to say, okay, and we'll protect you to make sure that God doesn't. Jesus Christ is arisen from the dead. And it is by the Holy Spirit, ultimately, that convicts us of this good news. In other words, we cannot come to believe in Jesus Christ as a risen Savior on our own reasoning and strength. It's going to have to be by God's divine wisdom. It's going to have to be by God's divine power. And so he gives to us the Holy Spirit who convicts us of this truth. Because as, as we read here, from Luke chapter 24. We hear where Jesus appears to the disciples and they think that he is a ghost. I mean, after all, what else are they to expect? I mean, it was hard enough because here they followed Jesus for three years and they were thinking that Jesus was going to rise to some uh, wonderful power and that they were going to be part of this, in a sense, new uh, regime of government. But instead, the authorities, the Roman authorities and the religious authorities, do away with him. They crucify him. And so the disciples, at this point, I would say, are very despondent. Well, they were. Matter of fact, they fled. They betrayed Jesus. They, they all fled. They ran. They hid. They said, boy, have we ever been taken as fools? We followed Jesus right up until the bitter end, where we know now the writing that we could see coming on the wall is now happening. And so at that point, they didn't want anything to do with Jesus, but they were all huddled up there, you know, and they were grieving, they were disappointed. I'm sure they were angry, all of these emotions that we go through as we are thoroughly let down. But as the good news came to them that Jesus Christ is arisen from the dead, and as Jesus appeared to them, they thought that Jesus was a ghost. And a lot of times we may just say, oh, you know, whatever this is, that I'm sure that it was just like some kind of a, a, a hallucination, a mirage that they were experiencing. You know, sometimes we may think that our brain, our neurons are do, doing things to trick us. If we've been traumatized, if we are under deep emotion, and if we're tired and angry and putting all that together to say, well, all of a sudden now we are seeing things like a ghost. 
But the thing of it is, it'd be one thing if one of these people, if one of the disciples were seeing Jesus. You know, the other ones would say, hey, uh, Thomas, we, or actually Thomas wasn't there the first time, but, but John, you're seeing things. You're seeing a ghost. We don't see anything here in this room. But they all saw it. Matter of fact, lots of people witnessed Jesus as the risen Savior. At one point, there were 500 that witnessed him as in his risen presence. And so when we think about the spiritual world, you know, I can't help but think of this man who, oh, who is an atheist. He says he's a realist. He doesn't believe in demons. He doesn't believe in angels. He doesn't believe in the spiritual realm. Until one day, you know, there was, you know, family members that were claiming that they saw a ghost in one of the homes of one of the relatives. And he was, of course, not believing this. He was very skeptical. Until one day he was in that house, and all of a sudden, he saw the same person that everybody else was seeing. And so, now I personally, I've never seen a ghost. And I'm a believer. But this person, who in a sense said that he was not a believer, now all of a sudden, well, he's at least a believer in ghosts because he has seen. And it wasn't like he could just say, oh, I've had a bad day. You know, maybe I had too much ca caffeine or something like that. You know, I've not been feeling so well. No, because he was seeing exactly what so many other people in that house were seeing. And so Jesus was not a ghost. And so we hear where in this account from Luke chapter 24, where they saw Jesus and they were actually able to, to touch Jesus and to hear Jesus. They saw him eat food. And I think about what John wrote in 1 John chapter 1. He says, That which was from the beginning, which we had heard, which we had seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim uh, concerning the word of life. So in other words, John was saying, We saw Jesus. We touched Jesus. We heard Jesus. And so whatever senses, you know, that you know, how we learn and how we know about things. You know, we can touch something, we can see something, we can smell something, we can hear to say that this is reality. And the thing of it is, is that they all were experiencing that. And the thing of it is, is that they all fled. But the interesting thing is, is that now they all were following Jesus in such a way that they were willing to go out and they suffered great persecution. Matter of fact, all of these people who had witnessed this died a martyr's death except John and not to say that he didn't experience persecution as he was imprisoned and so forth. And so if this were all a hoax, so let's say that they all got together somewhere along the line and just said, well, let's make up all of this. Well, pretty soon their stories are going to break down or, you know, somewhere along the line, one of them is going to say, oh, you know, this was all just a story. <laughs> it's all a hoax. But nobody came forward and said anything like that. And especially when they were being tortured, they were being beaten, they were being imprisoned, they were uh, going without food. And I don't know about you, but if I'm being beaten, and if I'm in prison, and if I'm hungry, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to sit there and hold on to a hoax. I'll be the first one to say, hey, you know, we just all made up a story. Now give me some food. Or quit beating me. But they didn't. They all went to, they all died a martyr's death. And so that does say something, doesn't it? That they witness this. And so what does Jesus say to them? Jesus said to them, peace be with you. That's the first words that Jesus said as he met his disciples was, peace be with you. Now isn't that something, peace? I mean, peace is something that, at least this kind of peace, is only something that comes from God. We can't manufacture this peace on our own. We can't get it anywhere else in this world. It's not like we can go to some wise old fellow that lives two hills down, down the highway and, and who just is kind of some wise old sage that's giving out wisdom and that can give out peace. No, only God can give this peace. And it's the peace that we all need. It's the peace that we all long for in our hearts. And, we, and you know what I'm talking about. You know, when something is agitating us, when something is not right, 
it troubles us. And we know when things are not right with God. We've got a guilty conscience. We don't feel good about ourselves. We know what we've done wrong. And even though we may try in our mind to say, oh, you know, my mind is just tricking myself. And, and uh, really, I just need to kind of, you know, use more um, common today intellectual approaches to, to try to work through whatever it is that I'm feeling, that we know what this peace is. And, and, you know, as a pastor of a church, as I've been a pastor now for well over 27 years, I've been... <laughs> the pastor to a lot of people who are grieving. And the thing that I most commonly hear from people who are grieving is that they will say that our loved one died in peace. We're so thankful that our loved one died in peace. In other words, that is like an eternal state of our being. It's like one of those foundational points of life that we all need. It's something that we need throughout our whole life. Peace all the way through, all the way to the end, that we can die in peace. And so this peace of God comes through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it is, and it was, of course, when they witnessed Jesus, the risen Christ, he was in Jerusalem. And what does the name Jerusalem literally mean? It means the city of peace. And so as Jesus is, is saying to them, peace be with you, that there's peace in Jerusalem. There's peace in the lives of these disciples who have witnessed Jesus and who now have received him as the risen Christ. And that this peace is now to shine out from Jerusalem into all the nations of the world, you know, sometimes our world can become very dark because, our, because we're, we're having turmoil, we're having war, you know, conflicts. You know, we have problems within our own soul. We have problems with other people. And so, oh, how we long for peace. And when we see peace, when we experience peace, it's like light shining in the darkness. And that is what is shining from Jerusalem into all the nations of the world. The peace of God. And so the first thing is that, that we have peace with God. Because with the fall of sin and humanity, that there's separation with God, that we're now enemies with God. But now Jesus, in his death and his resurrection, that, that God now has made us his friend. You know, when, you are, when we are at odds with somebody, I'll tell you what, we can feel it. And we can feel it in our stomach. And we can pretend like it's not bothering us, but it is. And we don't want to have that feeling with God. We want to have peace with God. You know, I've known, in the sense of die, but I've known some people in churches that I've served that were World War II veterans, where they were in some of the most awful battles, in their trenches, in their foxholes, bombs exploding all over the place, gunfire, and they really felt like their life was a moment-by-moment -moment existence. And, well, that's the way that it was, because so many of their fellow comrades died in those moments. But yet, I remember what some of them said, but even in the midst of that, I always had peace with God, that if I were to die in this moment, that all is well with God. And that they knew where they were going, that God has prepared a special place for them, because God loves them. As we read in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, the Apostle Paul says, The peace of God which surpasses all human understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so that is the peace. It's, it's a peace that's hard to describe. It's a peace beyond our human understanding. But it's a peace that only God can give to us. And that we also may have peace with one another. To see that we can be at peace, that we can be at peace to be the church together, that we can come together and that we can strengthen one another in our faith. And so as I think about something that I really like, that is chocolate. And it seems like chocolate, now I just like just eating pure chocolate, but I do like chocolate over things. I like chocolate over my ice cream. I like chocolate covered 
peanuts. I like chocolate-covered raisins. I like uh, chocolate-covered pretzels. Anything that's covered with chocolate. In fact, I was whitewater rafting on a river in Colorado once where the guide was saying, well, in this particular town, they got this store and they have the best chocolate-covered bacon. And I just kind of thought, chocolate-covered bacon? I've never heard of that before. And so once you know I tried some, and it was actually very good. But if we were to say, if we could cover ourselves with chocolate, everybody's going to like us. Say, oh boy, Jeff is really good. I don't think there's anything that can help make a friendship than to offer somebody a piece of chocolate. Well, the thing of it is, is that we can't have a chocolate-covered Jeff, and yeah, people, we can't be chocolate-covered, but we can be covered with Christ. And that is better than chocolate. And so as you're living a Christ-like life, that people are going to like you. Because you're going to love other people. You're going to be concerned about other people. You are going to serve other people. You're going to show kindness. You're going to care for, the, for others. You're going to be doing thing, good things in the community where people are going to notice and say, you know what? I may not be a believer, but I'll tell you, there's something about that guy or something about those people that I really like. And I like to have them living next door to me. I like having them on various boards in our community because they are always striving for the good. And they are working at rec you know, bringing, uh, trying to heal differences, uh, bridging gaps, building each other up, bringing the most out of one another. And then we also need to have peace with ourselves. You know, sometimes we may say, well, yeah, I've got peace with God and I've got peace with other people. But boy, I sure struggle individually. And that's where sometimes we carry some guilt, we carry remorse, we carry disappointments, regrets. You know, maybe we didn't accomplish a certain goal or maybe we've done something wrong that we feel uh, ashamed of. Maybe we don't like the way that we have treated other people. I don't know what it is. But we know what it is that's gnawing at our soul. And that's where the Lord wants us to relinquish us. To, you know, as we read in Hebrews chapter 13, that we are to put aside every weight that, that, that certainly burdens us down. That we may run the good race. The good race of faith. And that's the way Jesus wants us to be, that we are to break the chains of our bondage, sweep away all of the, the garbage that we don't want in our lives, and to allow the Holy Spirit to come and to dwell within us. And so we may say, well, good for the disciples. They got to see Jesus. I never had that opportunity. Haven't even seen a ghost. But like Thomas, remember what Jesus said to Thomas? He said, Thomas, you have come to believe because you've seen me. But blessed are those who do not see me and still believe. And we hear the same thing as that, wait here, Jesus says, because the time's going to come when the Holy Spirit's going to come and will fill your hearts and he will bring you to the convictions, to these truths. And so that's the whole thing, is that by the Holy Spirit and by studying the Word of God, that you can come to that same strong faith in believing in Jesus Christ as the risen Savior, just as the disciples did. You know, before Jesus died on a cross, he was sharing with his disciples at least three times. It's recorded in the Gospels three times where Jesus said to them, prophesied, that the Son of Man must Go to, you know, must be handed over to the authorities, must suffer and die and rise from the dead. Well, now, after the resurrection, they said, oh, yeah, do you remember when Jesus said that? Now light bulbs are starting to come on. He said that. But then as you go through the scriptures, as you read the Psalms, as you read the prophecies, as you read the law, that we see that Jesus is the fulfillment of, of all of what was written, all of what was spoken. That Jesus Christ is the Savior, the one who fulfills the law and the prophets. And so 
I'm going to, at this time, just read in here again. You know, the whole Bible is just full of this. You know, as far as, uh, you know, as far as Jesus being the fulfillment of. But I'll just read all oh, the first five verses of Psalm chapter 22, and so it's prophesied. And so, you know, as we read through this psalm, and I encourage you to read through the whole psalm, that Jesus certainly is the one. I mean, it's described as being somebody who is dying on a cross. And of course, Jesus is, Jesus is that one. Matter of fact, he even quotes his first verse. He says, my God, my God, why has, um, my, oh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night and am not silent. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In you, our fathers, put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were saved. If you, they trusted and were not disappointed. And I would encourage you to read on in there, but it just you know, talks about you know, somebody who's dying on a cross and Jesus is that one. And then if you were to read in Isaiah 53, the same thing about a suffering servant who is dying on the cross. And as you read that, even though this is all you know, documented 700 years before Jesus ever came, that as you re read that, that's prophecy of the one, Jesus, who will be suffering and dying on a cross for us, dying on a tree, and it's by his wounds that we will be healed. And so, you know, and I also encourage you to read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That would be the resurrection chapter. And that is the hope that it's God's plan that, that God not only raised Jesus from the dead, but the reality of it, of it is, is that he's going to raise you from the dead. Now, it's great news that Jesus is arisen. And it's not just good news for that Jesus is arisen, but it's good news that you will rise again, that because of Jesus Christ, we too live in the victory of the risen Jesus. And for that, we also will be more than conquerors. You have been watching To Know Christ with Reverend Jeff Peterson, pastor of the Lutheran Church of Peace in Platteville, Wisconsin. For a donation of $15 or more, you can receive a copy of Pastor Peterson's latest book, A Basic Christian Theology. Thank you for watching, and tune in again next week for To Know Christ.